Hello Booktube. Let's indulge me a little more and go through some more Regency romances, shall we? Uh, for those of you who are new, I'm talking about old-style Regency romances published mostly by Signet uh, in the late 1980s and uh, early 1990s uh, that are very uniform things. They're very corseted things. On the surface, they look exactly the same one as the other. Uh, they're patterned on Pride and Prejudice. They are two fairly well-born, uh, obviously and obviously compatible lovers who meet and squabble and eventually fall in love. And then the final chapter, the unwritten chapter, is that they marry uh, and live happily ever after. Uh, and I love these things. Absolutely love them. Uh, and uh, I have a huge number of them. <laughs> and, and as an indulgence to me, I've been going through this as a sort of conclusion to my library tour. Uh, because they were the last part of the library tour, and I was just assuming that none of you wanted to see this. A few of you <laughs> have said you don't mind, and that's all I need. <laughs> that's all the encouragement I need. Uh, so let's see what this first one is that we have. Oh, all right, well, we've seen this before. I pulled it down for a couple of examples uh, of things. This is the impoverished Viscount. Here are these people are at a fancy dress ball. Uh, so what have we got here? Uh... Young and inexperienced Lady Melissa Stapleton was adrift in a world of deception and desire. Lord Heflin, the most rapacious rake in England, had her brother in his debt and Melissa at his mercy. She had to flee his odious advances, only to find herself in greater danger. We might have heard, I might have described this one before, maybe it shifted. Uh, Lord Charles Rathbone was far more charming and seductive than the horrific Heflin. Yet Rathbone was as an infamous rake and he, as he was irresistible. Now Rathbone chose Melissa as the woman he wanted, and not merely to satisfy his lust. He needed her to pose as his bride-to-be, and with Heflin hot on her trail, she had, to, she had to agree to the monstrous masquerade. She was not only a stranger afraid in this realm of devious deception, but also an imperiled innocent when it came to denying Rathbone his desires and masking her own. <laughs> so, she's caught between two noblemen. Uh, Let's see here. Let's see if this next one is. All right. Well, this is a signet Regency romance, like most of these things are, but you can tell right away just by looking at it that it's considerably older. Uh, this is by uh, Dorothy Mack. Let's let's actually see. So, the Impoverished Viscount is by Allison Lane, and it came out in 1996. Our next book is by Dorothy Mack. It's the Last Waltz, and you can see right away the difference in the cover. Right? This is going on towards being photorealistic. Uh, and this is not so much. This is more of, you can see artistic flourishes all throughout there. So this came out in uh, 1986. Uh, and is older. Uh, I don't know if you can make it out, but the color, the stock of the, of the covers is discoloring. The pages, I would have to reinforce this, in other words, if I were going to read it. And I am going to read it, so I will eventually reinforce it. Uh, let's see here. Miss Adrian Castle. Had inherited only one thing beside debts from her dashing, feckless father. She had learned from him a remarkable skill at cards. Uh, and that, sk that skill now was all that could keep her and the rest of the family from ruin. In disguise, she mastered every gentleman at the gambling table. But there was no disguising the fact that one gentleman had become master of her heart. Lord Dominic Crichton had everything. Wealth, charm, good looks, and the most ravishing woman in England as his fiancée. Clearly, a young lady without fortune and with a scandalous secret life faced the most daunting odds in trying to capture this most perfect of men, unless she played every card just right and didn't miss a trick. Uh, so that that sounds like fun, and that also is a uh, a somewhat rare thing, comparatively rare in Regency in these old style Regency romances, that one character is facing financial ruin uh, and trying to work their way out of it, as opposed to marrying their way out of it. I think it would probably be true, I haven't, haven't touched the book, I don't know anything more about it than what I just read you, but I think it's probably true that the, that the main character's dashing and reckless father was a member of the landed gentry, and that she therefore, he therefore squandered what would otherwise have been a comfortable fortune. Uh, but we shall see. <laughs> we shall see. Okay, this next one is in ratty shape. I had to reinforce it uh, with tape. Uh, just to read it, and I did read it, and I liked it. <laughs> I liked it quite a bit. This is also by Allison Lane. This is Lord Avery's Legacy. Uh, with a, an old-style sketch cover. And your eyes are not deceiving you. Those are ostriches in the background. <laughs> uh, they play a part. 
in the book, believe it or not, they do, and including uh, stepping forward in a dramatic moment. Uh, it's it's an, an amazing thing, the, the way they're worked into the story. Uh, Penelope Wingrave was extraordinary, from her flaming red hair to her scheme for raising ostriches. Also, she was on the shelf, too high-born to marry down, too poor to marry nobility. Her sister, on the other hand, was being courted by the late Lord Avery's haughty son, a matter that worried Penelope mightily, especially when the speeding curricle, driven by another member of that arrogant clan, landed her in a ditch. Not only did he blame her for the mishap, he impetuously took her to his arms. Uh, Na new trustee Richard Avery has... Oh, God help us, I can barely read the words. They're all, they're all ratted out here. Well, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, Penelope uh, is... she all, In addition to raising ostriches for their plumes and sometimes their eggs, she also uh, has all sorts of side works, including a pottery works on her on her relatively meager property. Um, she's trying desperately to get the whole property back on a paying basis. And she's doing it in a very refreshing way because she, she's, she isn't, as the, the cover makes clear, she isn't looking to marry. She's trying to, to do this by, by her own industry and by her own economy. Uh, and that's a tremendous sense of, of, uh, of independence. Uh, this is another one we saw earlier, uh, what was it, uh, The Lonely Earl by Vanessa Gray. Uh, I would have called this something else. I would have titled it something else. Lord, Lord Avery is dead by the time the book starts. This, the, the main characters are not him. I don't know why uh, you would call it this. And I'm not also not 100% not sure uh, that his legacy in the book is all that important. I, I would have called it something else, but either way, uh, I thought it was terrific. Uh, and a bit unusual, a bit unconventional. Uh, what have we got next? Oh, goodness. All right, this is Edith Layton, The Duke's Wager. Oh, my. So once again, we're dealing with the highest rank of British aristocracy outside of the royal family. And the dukes are um, right next to being kings, right next to it, right next to being princes of the realm. Um, let's see here. The lovely Regina Berryman was pursued by two men, the two most attractive and infamous bachelors in London. One was Jason Thomas, Lord of Torquay, whose skill and success in seduction had made him a legend of lordly licentiousness. I think we've seen this before. I may be duplicating some of these. Wouldn't that be the just the, the, the coup de grace through, in addition to driving, to putting you through all this tedium if I was repeating books. <laughs> just like their readers do. Their readers read them and don't realize they've read them before. The other was St. John Basil St. Charles, Marquis of Bessicar, the devilish duke's only rival as the foremost rake of the realm. These two notorious gentlemen had made Regina fair game in a competition where all was considered legitimate strategy in winning her affection and capturing her virtue. Uh, that that emphasizes an element of these things that I mentioned uh, the other day that I really like, which is their inconsequentiality. <laughs> so their their inconsequentiality is often their saving grace. Uh, okay, this is by Edith Layton as well. This is False Angel. There we have well-born people at an archery contest. You see the the obligatory opulent country house in the background. Uh, Lord Jocelyn Kidd, Marquess of Severn was the handsomest and most charming nobleman in London, and the most notorious. Not only had he been divorced under shocking circumstances from a young and innocent bride, but since that disastrous event he had shown no scruples and met no refusal in conquering beauty after beauty. The lovely lady Leonora Talwin has heard all the stories about him and understood them only too well, having seen from her womanizing father example, from her womanizing father's example how base and brutish men could be. Never, she vowed, would she fall victim to a rake like the scandalous Severn. But I think we know how that's going to go. <laughs> uh, okay, then we have, I think we have seen these before. Have we? Have we seen these before? Or have I just shown you? I show you lots of, uh, lots of examples of stuff, and I just pull them right off the shelf. Maybe that's what's going on here. Uh, well, well, we'll persevere. Uh, this next one is uh, by Elena Green. This is Saving Lord Vernwood. We have the opulent pile in the background. Uh, a later thing, this still has the sheen on, on the cover, the pages are still nice and bright, uh, it's, there's, no, there's no discoloration. This thing won't need to be reinforced, it's just as new as the day it was made. Uh, yeah, we, I think we have seen these before. Lord Vernwood, Lord Vernwood was an, an unapologetic connoisseur of the fairer sex. 
With his smoldering good looks and disreputable past, he's the talk of the Brighton summer season. Oh, we're in Brighton. Uh, but not for Miss Penelope Talcott. The demure and virtuous young woman wishes only for a devoted husband, a country parsonage, and a family to care for. <laughs> and she will domesticate, hence the title, she will domesticate Lord Verwood into wanting those same things. Uh, so what, what else have we got here? This one's a little thicker. Okay, this is also Edith Layton, but, but uh, uh, this is an older book. You can tell right from the cover that this is older. Uh, these things, some of them don't hold up well to, to time. 1986, when all the world made sense. Uh, Lady of Spirit. Miss Victoria Dawkins was in a most perilous position, cast out of respectable society by a scarlet slur on her good name, alone and penniless in London's lower depths. Yeah, so we've seen this. I must be duplicating these. Isn't that terrible? Well, let's let's go on to, uh, to some that maybe I'm not duplicating. Uh, oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> We're having a little bit of a... Oh, God. <laughs> a little bit of a collapse here of the tripod. It's not, it's not getting... Uh, not getting enough to sustain it. <laughs> that might do. Uh, uh, okay. All right. Uh, this next one is perhaps the most famous Regency novel of them all. Uh, and it, it, it's a bit of a coup for Signet Regency romance. They have all these authors. We've seen dozens of them, and there are dozens and dozens more. People that made their career out of doing one of these a month for Signet. Uh, but they were, and I said these were patterned after Pride and Prejudice, but they were also patterned after Georgette Heyer the greatest Regency writer of them all, and the one that everybody imitated in one form or another, because she made an enormously profitable career out of writing Regency romances. Uh, and Signet Regency romance eventually put out her books, looking exactly like all the others, so that if you didn't know her from, uh, from, any, from Nancy Butler or Alison Lane or whatever, you might not even guess that you were going to step into something much, much different, far more researched and atmospheric. And usually far funnier. And of all of Georgette Heyer's Regency romances, Regency Buck is probably her most famous. This or The Corinthian or uh, Devil's Cub, but a handful. There are only a handful of the many, many that she wrote. I think Signet did them all. I think Signet printed them all. Um, but this is, this is, it's a great big thing. It's, uh, let's see here, Miss Judith Taverner should have been reveling in her first London season. She was young, beautiful, witty, and heiress to a great fortune. Just one thing stood in the way of her indulgent fondness, of her indulging her fondest desires. Her guardian, Julian St. John Audley, the Earl of Worth, the most handsome and elegant blue blood in the town. Uh, not the town, the town, T-O-N, the best people. Uh, and a man determined to make Judith a slave to his iron will. What was that sound? What's the matter with you? The bean has been a little bit willful all day. I'm not really sure why. Uh, but she gets her. She gets to be willful as she wants. Uh, let's see here. Let's make sure we don't have a collapse. No slur on the tripod. It is still a miracle invention. Ah, okay. All right. Well, this next one is Devil's Cup by Georgette Heyer. I don't think I have many Georgette Heyers in the old Signet Regencies that are made to look exactly like all the others. They're made to look that way, uh, but they don't. They don't tend to read that way. Uh, Miss Mary Challoner was innocent in the ways of love, but not ignorant of the ways of the world. She knew very well what kind of man the Marquis of Vidal was, and what he wanted of Mary's exquisite sister, Sophia. Sophia, however, would not heed Mary's warning that the breathtakingly handsome Vidal was the most scandalous seducer in the realm, which left Mary with only one way to keep her sister's virtue intact. She had to throw herself into Vidal's clutches, trusting her wit and nerve to get her out safely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. Uh, but we'll go on. <laughs> we'll go on. This is a lot of fun for me, uh, and you can just skip these videos if they're not interesting to you. Uh, but I'm gonna go sit down. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stop for now. Stopping with George Ed Hire is uh, is stopping at a high point anyway. Uh, so I'll, I will see you soon. Thank you, Booktube.